Okay, I feel like I'm working on this play right now with my sister, and uh, I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm missing my uh, point here. But anyway, I'm going to soldier on. So a, a big part of um, what was a revelation or a revolution for me in, in reading and, and beginning to understand this, this approach to stats was a dichotomy that some of you might have heard of before, and it's between frequentists and what are known as frequentists and what are known as Bayesians. And so just to kind of give you the lay of the land here, frequentists are like you and me, and that, you know, what we've done in the course up to this point. And we've talked about it a lot, but it, it Frequentists really it comes down to a couple of things which we which we discussed really early on in the course. Remember, I was talking about the distribution of sample means, you know, when we're back trying to do a confidence interval or trying to test uh, uh, an hypothesis about about what a mean value is. and And so with frequentists, as I indicate with this incredible photo here, it's it's like a cage match between the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis so it's it's like a it's like a binary choice and you know as much as we talk about power and effect size and how much was the difference or how big was the slope it really comes down to that dichotomous choice you know is are we going to accept or reject the null um bayesians which i've represented i I think that's uh, what's it called, the Bachelor or something like that. Um, so the Bayesian approach again. I I don't want to obsess about all the the math behind it, but it really comes down to a choice or looking at a number of competing hypotheses, and um, that's what I've tried to represent with the thirty odd um, folks there that. I guess, is that The Bachelor in the front there? I don't know. I never watched the show. Well, I watched it once. I lied. But anyway, the idea that rather than a binary choice, null or alternative, it's like um, 10, 12, sometimes an infinite number of hypotheses, competing hypotheses, and which one's more likely than another one? What's the relative likelihood of these different hypotheses? So that's that's the basic choice. And, and the book, Rethinking, and the approach, and the reason I characterized it as, as me, you know, a revolution for me in terms of stats, is that it, it made me at least more aligned with the Bayesian way of approaching data analysis than the frequentist way. And you've heard me, you know, I think you've caught occasionally that I kind of dis obsession with testing null hypotheses and that that sort of thing. And that's, and I've always, I've actually done that for a long time because oftentimes people don't really worry about, as we talked about when I talked about power, people don't really worry about type two error and all that. But they certainly are obsessed with, you know, are, is that a significant difference or is it just a difference? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and to me, the whole, or the big attraction to a Bayesian approach wasn't so much some of the other philosophical differences between these two groups, but it was really about, I don't know, I just, it gave me more than just this decision about, you know, do the data support or refute the null hypothesis? So I want to I want to kind of set that up, the Bayesian approach. There's another aspect of the book that we'll get to uh, eventually in a few minutes, but I want to set up the contrast between the frequentist approach and the Bayesian approach, you know, and Forgive me if you're not in this sort of aquatic ecology world, but as I told you right at the beginning, I really only understand stats um, 
when I actually have to think about methods or approaches in the context of my research and kind of what I'm interested in as a scientist. So, so the example that I'm going to describe to you here and the, the actual use of frequentist versus Bayesian approaches, and it's super simple, don't worry, super simple kind of context is, is actually a simulated data set that I constructed, you know, as part of this book that I'm, I'm trying to finish up. So the simulated data set, it's appropriately called sim streams, and I'll just type it in here. So in case my and and you'll see in the uh, lab four folder, um, you know, I, I show you, I give you the R code, which we can talk about more next week. Um, and the R code, before I even get to doing the analysis of the data. So I have a, I think the script's called biota generator or something like that, where I actually crank out simulated values that have certain properties um, of the uh, benthic community. That, those are benthic invertebrates that you see up in the top right here. So my, I, I love them. I mean, I, my heart warms just looking at that dish of, what have we got here? I, I know there's a couple of people that know benthic invertebrates here. So, so this guy here, I think you're seeing my, my yellow um, arrow. That looks like an odinate nymph there, a dragonfly nymph. Um, right beside him is a stonefly. Um, a big guy over here is another stone fly. We've got, looks like uh, Cephenidae. Those are water penny uh, beetle larvae over here. And um, yeah, a bunch of stuff there. But anyway, um, so in, in my uh, discipline, my area of aquatic ecology, very common for us to, you know, you go to sites and in this case streams, and you, you uh, get a sample from the bottom substrate and uh, you get that sample back to the lab and you figure out what was living in that point where you sampled the bottom substrate. And that, that helps you characterize uh, the nature of the, the community and the ecosystem in the, in the stream at that, at that point. So in my simulated uh, stream systems, I think there's like 950 of them. Uh, they're from two different, uh, what I call eco regions. One of them, which is represented in that top left photo is the highlands. Um, so it's sort of stream flowing off a, a mountainside kind of thing. And then the other one is the valley or the lowlands. That's the, the bottom photo there. That one happens to be, looks like it's flowing through a farm field. Um, so streams were sampled in those two areas, at least simulated sampling in those two areas. And then um, there's a variety of, for each stream that was sampled, there's a variety of catchment areas. That's the area of land that drains into the stream. Um, and then there's also a, a variety of, remember I work on bioassessments, so there's a variety in the amount of farming activity that's going on in the catchment of the streams. So all of that blended together and the biological data, at least that I'm gonna talk about today, that using these examples, is just the number of species that were present at the stream site. So species richness, as we call it in ecology. Um, so I'm going to show you, again, with these two major approaches, how we answer questions about, in this case, species richness in these streams. Um, so let's take a look at that. So first, First thing, and, and again, realize that, um, you know, as we've discovered going through the course, you folks uh, hopefully are starting to appreciate now, you've actually done a lot 
And certainly by the time you're done lab three, you will have done a ton of different techniques, approaches in, uh, to looking at data. Generally speaking, in, in the vast majority of cases with sort of linear models, frequentist approach. What I'm gonna show you here is gonna be uh, down to the three, three kind of simplest type of approaches that we, we've dealt with. Um, one is just estimating means and, and associated with that standard deviations and confidence intervals, that kind of thing. That's the frequentist approach. And um, the Bayesian approach, I'm just gonna get rid of this annoying Zoom menu. The frequentist approach is um, looking at how likely different combinations of values for the mean and standard deviation are given the data. And that, that wording probably sounds really awkward and weird, but as I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute, the results that each method leads to in this very simple question, you know, what, what's the average species richness in this area? And, um, but it gets their different routes. And uh, I'll, I'll try to explain the crux of how they're different uh, as we go through. So here's uh, the, the two sides. So this is a bit of a busy slide. So let me, let me pause with it for a sec. And the, the yellow box that you see on the left is the frequentist approach. This is, this is our approach that we used probably back in, well, lab one, I guess. We didn't really calculate confidence intervals then, but, um, you know, we were looking... We're just looking at the distribution of a quantitative variable here. You know, we we I think maybe did a box plot of it or something like that, but just just one, you know, just one group of observations. And what's what's our guess in terms of what the mean is? And what's the confidence interval on that? And we we talked about why that's interesting to us and what's going on. So the first thing that you see, if we look on the left, you see a frequency distribution up there. The two, the two sort of stacks of bars. So, and we've got species richness on the x-axis, and then we've got it just says density there, but it's just it's like a frequency histogram. And what I've done is overlain that with based on the mean of the observations, the same mean that you, you know, you've calculated a million times before, what would the normal distribution like? So based on the estimated mean and the standard deviation from that set of observations, and I think there's like 900 of them or something like that, um, what would a normal distribution of observations look like? So you can see, it's pretty easy for you to see um, there's two, there seems to be two groups of, of observations there. And we'll get to that when we get to comparing means. But as you know, that's when, when we're trying to estimate a confidence interval or something, you know, we got a column of data, which is species richness. And we calculate what the, what the uh, sample mean is. In this case, it's 70.65946, so about 71 species is the mean. And the standard deviation uh, looks like it's 23.2. And so we can calculate, you know, same way as always, we can calculate a confidence interval from that, given the sample size and everything. And that's from 69 to 72. So that's the frequentist approach. And remember, remember what that was based on. That was based on, remember, remember the idea that, well, if we went out a whole bunch of times and took a sample of 925 observations every time, we'd get a distribution of the sample means. And then the confidence interval is based on 
what that you know the the variability in those repeated sample mean estimates and that's why they call the frequentist approach frequentist so the whole underlying kind of logic of it is that there's this kind of hypothetical population mean value and we're trying to figure out what it is. So remember, we're looking for mu. We're trying to estimate mu, the population mean, by taking a sample. And we're calculating that confidence interval based on this hypothetical repeatedly taking samples of size, in this case, 925. And that's why they call it frequentist, <laughs> the frequentist approach, because it's always about this Hypothetical, we took a whole bunch of sample means. And then the distribution of that allowed us to make this inference about what the, the size of the confidence interval would be. And, and same sort of logic going on if we were testing a hypothesis about whether or not the mean species richness was greater than 80 or above, outside of the bounds of 60 and and 70 or whatever so in all of those approaches and the, they're the approaches we've used so far in the course it's always based on there's some parameter out there we're trying to estimate or two parameters in this case mu the population mean and sigma the population standard deviation and we use those estimates of it to say, okay, we think we're 95% confident that the population mean is somewhere between 69.1 and 72.1. Okay, so again, we can calculate confidence intervals, we could do hypothesis tests on that, that value of the mean based on that underlying logic. So how does that differ in the Bayesian approach? So on the right, you're seeing the R code for carrying out the Bayesian approach, but I think it it makes more sense if I put it into words. Um, so the R code, well, well, think of it this way. Remember when we were we we're testing null hypotheses about what the what the mean might be? Is it greater than eighty? Is it is it less than seventy five or or whatever? um our logic remember the number of times i would say well what is the p-value the p-value is what's the chance of getting these data if the null were true that's that's always what a p-value means in the frequentist universe so in the bayesian universe we're really we're turning that around and opening things up to other hypotheses, including the null. And that is, we're saying, what's the chance of this hypothesis given these data? So you see how we've, we've reversed it. And we're saying, rather than saying, you know, I wonder, I wonder how likely it was to get these data if the null was true. And then when it's, if it's super unlikely, we reject the null. But in the case of Bayesian, we turn it around and we say, okay, given that we got these data, how likely is it that this hypothesis is true or that hypothesis or that other one? So what you're left with is not a sort of binary decision. Is it yes, reject the null or no, don't reject the null. It's a, well, this one's kind of likely this one's not likely at all. This one's super unlikely. This one is really likely. So you get a likelihood of a whole bunch of hypotheses with the Bayesian approach. And how does it do that? So this is where I'm going to I'm going to sweep a bunch of complexity not under the rug but hopefully try to make it at least um, understandable to you. So what we do with the Bayesian approach, and that's why I, I use a super simple example of, um, of just trying to estimate species richness, mean species richness, and what it was. So is we have 
what are called priors. What's our prior knowledge? And this is not based on the data. It's just, you know, here's what I think. I think the mean species richness in this in these areas, across these areas, is 80 species. And I think that mean, the standard error of the mean is 10. That's my that's my sort of starting point. Kind of, that's what I'm going to lay on the table as a starting point. And I think the variability, the standard deviation, how much one stream varies to the other, not means, but how much one stream varies to the other, is somewhere between zero and 40. It's got to be more than zero, but it's probably less than 40. And so then what the Bayesian fitting thing does, which is, you know, it, it's very mathematically very mundane it says i'm going to take every possible combination of mu values and sigma values so take all those possible combinations there and for each combination i'm going to take the data points the data that i've seen and add up across every data point, all 925 data points. Okay, how likely is it that this hypothesis was true given these data? So if I got a bunch of data, basically the, the data are going to inform or allow me to refine my prior idea of what the mean and the standard deviation is in the population. So it looks at every combination and it says, okay, um, I got I got this data point, you know, with 42 species, I got this data point with 71 species, and this data point with 51 species. And for each of those points, it's gonna say it's gonna tap across all of them. How likely were was this group of points to come from a distribution that had a particular mu value? and a particular sigma value. So it's gonna look at all those combinations and then get the range of the most likely value for the mean of the population and the value of the standard deviation of the population. And that's what you see at the bottom of that yellow box on the right, you see, okay, it's looked at the most likely value for the mean and the standard deviation for species richness. And the mean of those likely values is 70.7 .7 for the mean of the population and 23.1 for the standard deviation among individual streams. And then this 5.5% to 94.5%, it's not a confidence interval. It's just saying this is the range of likelihoods for the mean values, so somewhere between 69.5 and 71.9, and the most likely values for standard deviation, 22.3 and 24. So you're probably saying to me now, yeah, I think I get it. What you know, there's words coming out of his mouth, they don't really make much sense, but okay. How do those you're probably thinking, well, let me compare those to over here, the frequentist. Well, it's not that different. 70.65 for the mean versus 70.71 for the mean as estimated with Bayesian and standard deviation 23.20 versus 23.19. So yeah, like why would I bother using this weird technique if I kind of get the same answer with the frequentist approach? Well. The reason I'm showing it to you with this super simple situation, yes, of course, they're going to come out very similarly, but the same is not true for more complex models, more complex estimations. So what you really, all, all I want you to understand from this approach is on the left-hand side, it was the a confidence interval or a one sample uh, hypothesis test, t-test, they're based on this frequentist idea, and it's really saying how likely are these data if the null was true. 
So you're testing one hypothesis, yes or no. On the, on the right-hand side here, we've got a multitude of hypotheses about what the mean and standard deviation are of the population. And we're told how likely each combo is given the data that we have. And we, we started out with this idea of mean of 80, standard deviation somewhere between zero and 40. And the data have helped us refine our notion of what the most likely values are for mean and standard deviation. And if we get more data, we can refine those further. Okay, so that's, that's the very basic idea behind the difference. Let's look at the next, and we've just got two more levels that I want to do. The next kind of level, which again, we've done a lot, and that's comparing means, where we tested, remember in uh, lab two, the first question was about t-test between two groups of a quantitative variable. So we're testing hypotheses about the difference between means. And of course, this extends to ANOVA and that kind of stuff as well. But let's think about the simplest situation. And, and we as frequentists would adopt the approach either with a parametric t-test as we've done or, or maybe a homemade null of testing hypotheses about that difference. And again, it's the idea that there's a population mean of this group and a population mean of this group, this other group. And the question is, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference between them. They're the same. And we're testing that one null hypothesis. And Bayesians, on the other hand, and again, this is what made them attractive to me or the approach attractive to me, is that we're assessing the likelihood of all possible magnitudes and directions of differences between the means. So let me show you how that turned out with these data. Okay, first of all, we've got, this is comparing means with the frequentist approach, the cage match between the, um, the null and the alternative hypothesis. And you can see this, is, this sort of reveals where that, that two peaked frequency histogram came from a couple of slides ago. You can see on the left, we've got taxon richness on the y-axis. We've got these two eco regions that I have. And, and this is, you know, kind of semi realistic because in those highland streams, you don't tend to get as many species, not as much nutrients, harder to get to, all that, that kind of stuff. So there's fewer species there. The median is about under 40. Then in the lowland valley streams, where the median is up over 80, more than twice as much. And you got variability, I mean, you know, as we've seen in box plots many times. On the right-hand side is just uh, from my homemade null distribution, just showing you the, the T statistic, which is 88. It's like gargantuan. That's why you're not seeing, remember, the vertical dashed line because it's way, way out, you know, sort of out in the hallway here where I'm sitting. So that's the frequentist approach. We look at the difference. We test, we test the null hypothesis. What were the chance of getting these data? If the null was true, the null of no difference in the means, the chance was like Zippo. Here's the equivalent in, again, the, the same sort of format, and you'll use this next week when we go through the, the script. It looks really, kind of weird now, but it's the same idea that, that you propose values for fitting this Bayesian model. Those are the priors, so-called, and it then looks at every combination of values, those proposed values, and kind of looks for the optimum, the likelihood of every combination, given the, the data that you had. So in other words, to put it in the same words as we were using before with testing null hypotheses, we say, okay, what's the likelihood of this hypothesis given that we got this data set? So what you're seeing here is a model for 
species richness, and it's based on a parameter called a fit, a underscore fit, which is potentially a different value for each ecoregion. But the prior, sort of the prior in advance, is that the suggested value is 80 for each of the ecoregions with a standard error of the mean of 20. And then sigma, the suggestion is that somewhere between 0 and 50. And that's the variability among streams within each of the, the ecoregions. So you sort of, that, that initial, it's called an A list here, is really just, here's the realm I want you to look at combinations. And it looks at each of those combinations. And for each combination, it determines a likelihood given the data that you have. Because each combination, if you think about it, represents an, a null hypothesis, or sorry, an hypothesis. So a huge number, infinite number of hypotheses, and for each of them, a likelihood. How likely was that combination? So what you see below is the results of that, where we've got a fit one, which is the, the lowland, the valley, and the, the parameter for that is 85.85. So that's that's a the mean of the expected values for that parameter representing the species richness in the lowlands. And the range of values there, likely values between five and a half percent and 94.5 percent, is right around 85, 86. And the for the, the highland streams, we see the range of likely values between 38 and 39. So, and, and then the most likely value for the variability within those ecoregions, seven point, from 7.2 to 7.8. So in that case, it's not like we've accepted or rejected a null hypothesis of difference, but we're seeing, given the data, the most likely hypo uh, uh, sorry the most likely hypotheses are 85 86 species in the valley streams the lowland streams and 38 39 in the highland streams so that's that's evidence for us that yes the two ecoregions differ in in uh, species richness Okay, final final example to show this, um, the differences in the approach is regression. So as we all know, we're painfully aware that uh, as frequent as we estimate regression coefficients, whether we're in a multiple regression or a form of that in ANOVA, including two-way ANOVA, we estimate regression coefficients and their standard deviations and we test hypotheses or calculate confidence intervals about those about those coefficients. And same deal with Bayesians. And you know, this is getting like broken record time. Look at different combinations of values for coefficients and the standard deviation, how much things vary around that regression line, and see which ones are more or less likely given the data that you got. So here's how the modeling uh, and, and just a bit of an insight into the nature of my simulated data. This is where I introduced a quantitative predictor, watershed area, because it, and in real life, bigger stream catchment areas um, usually have more species associated with them in the water. They're just getting a bigger variety of habitats, it tends to be a bigger system. So you're seeing that quantitative predictor on the x-axis there, and then you see the categorical predictor, the two different symbols. And so you've got the, the uh, valley streams that are more species rich in the little triangles and the uh, hillside, I guess I call those uh, upland or highland streams for the little circles. I gotta get my captions uh, screwed on straight. So you can see already we've, we've looked at the difference between highland and lowland streams or what's called here hillside and valley streams. We know that there's more species in the valley than the, the uplands, highlands. But you can also see, I think, a little bit of an upswing 
in species richness, which of course I just modeled into the simulation um, as the watershed area or catchment area gets gets bigger. So we want to look at that statistically. And so here's here's the whole deal here on the left. Um, sorry, these are two. <laughs> I won't show you statistically how the the uh, I guess it would be ANCOVA in this case turns out with the frequentist approach. This is just the, the Bayesian approach. And what I wanted to show you is how different models can be compared once we once we've generated them. So all we're doing with this this regression approach is we have um, just an extra parameter in the model, the left hand box. We've still got a fit one and a fit two, which are the two uh, eco regions. But we also have B, which is a slope associated with the catchment area, the watershed area, and then still variation within, um, you know, around the regression line and within each of the eco regions. So there's that model, which is the same slope with eco region for, so for, sorry, for each eco region. On the right-hand side is a different slope, so a different relationship with catchment area with each eco region. And again, this is just showing the same same deal when it comes to fitting these models. That is, is looking at all the combinations, and then saying, okay, given that we got these data, which of these combinations are more or less likely? So, um, last step of this is that you gotta you gotta pick the best model. And the, this, you know, the way we do this in the frequentist world, and I think all of us have probably been there, is that, for example, if you got a bunch of quantitative predictors or quantitative or, or categorical predictors or both, you kind of do your analysis and you say, okay, which one, which one of them are significant, you know, uh, and let's cut out the ones that are not significant and we'll look at the ones that are and then and, and look at the parameter values and, and things like that. So there's challenges or issues with that that I'll talk about in just a sec, but with the Bayesian fitting, um, when we have alternative models like we were just looking at. So um, the, the three I'm comparing here are the, the bottom model, which is labeled EH ecoregion is just how much or how, how well does just knowing the ecoregion predict species richness versus ecoregion and catchment area? That's the middle model here. And then finally, ecoregion and catchment area with separate slopes with an interaction between them. And so what it's showing us here is that it really helped us a lot you know, good is towards the left on this weird plot that we're looking at. And it really helped us a lot to add catchment area to the model. Look at that jump downwards here from just ecoregion to ecoregion and, and uh, catchment area. And it helped us a bit, but not nearly as much when we incorporated an interaction between catchment area and ecoregion. So I just want to show you again, obviously you're not going to know in detail how to do this, but just to show you that there's relatively robust ways to compare models once you've developed them um, in, with the Bayesian approach. Okay, last, last thing, just for a few minutes, I wanna talk about the other aspect of, uh, of statistical rethinking that, again, I think is really important to think about. And it's really what led to Remember back in lab one, I made you uh, create a conceptual model for your your data set. And it's it's really thinking about, which I don't think we think enough about, and I'm including myself in this uh, as well as others. Um, and that's the difference between correlation and cause and and really getting into detail about about causal pathways. So correlation, and you know, there's lots of there's lots of joke, um, spurious correlations that folks have used. That you're just looking at one, which is the age of Miss America, which on the y-axis there, and um, sorry, the age, the age of Miss America, which is the, I think it's the red line, 
And then the blue line is murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Um, so it's showing that those two things, I guess, are look like they're positively correlated to some extent. And then an example of a cause-effect um, relationship on the right there, which is you've got um, gross oxygen uptake on the y-axis um, and heart rate on the, sorry, gross oxygen, oxygen uptake on the x-axis and heart rate on the y-axis. And um, definitely oxygen uptake is actually driving heart rate in that case um so and then you just see you just see two different models here these are i think they're uh obese adolescent boys and they're either uh, on a treadmill let's see open circles or uh, exercise bike that's the closed circles but the idea there is there's definitely uh, a causal relationship between those two so the way that you're going to look at and a common look at, and, and McElroy develops this a lot in the book, um, look at cause and the nature of cause is what's called a DAG or directed acyclic graph. And you see a really simple example of one here um, related to the example I've been talking about where you've got watershed area, which is partially causing species richness, the species richness that we're seeing in the stream. And notice there's no there's no kind of amount or thickness of the arrow or anything like that. It's just it's just the idea that the thing on the left is causing the thing on the right, not not the reverse, right? Species richness doesn't make the watershed area bigger in a stream. And it's that sounds so totally stupid, but it's realizing that, recognizing that with the data you have and thinking about it when it's not as obvious as in this situation so um and and just to kind of expand it up a notch we've got uh, two things as as i dealt with in that last model uh that we looked at so we've got eco region and watershed area are both causing species richness and things that even trickier well let, let me introduce one more thing into the equation to, uh, to show what I'm talking about. So in this case, <laughs> I've got uh, watershed area, which same as catchment area, I just haven't changed the slide. So we got watershed area, eco region, which I've already talked about. And then I mentioned that for each of my uh, 925 streams, I also have a, an index of farming activity. So that and those three things all affect species richness. But the other neat thing is that ecoregion affects farming, right? Um, you know, Adam Yates, when he was a grad student of mine uh, 15 years ago, he did this great study in southwestern Ontario, and he proved, and it was so funny because initially we thought we made this great discovery. Um, he proved that farming activity was not random in southern Ontario. And I remember telling my brother-in-law, longtime farming family from Chatham, this, and he said, uh, yeah, Nobel Prize time. Uh, obviously, farming activity varies according to ecoregion, so I incorporate that in the simulation. But what I want you to see here is in a DAG, in, a, in like a causal diagram like this, you have to be aware of and think about the fact that if I'm looking at the effect of farming on species richness, recognizing that farming itself is to some extent caused by the ecoregion that I'm in, which is another driver, direct driver of species richness. So that gets into um, McElroy's discussion of confounding variables. And again, whether, whether you ever get into Bayesian model fitting or not, I think this in itself is worth it for you to think really carefully about with your with your own research. Um, and that it there's four basic kinds of confounding variables. And you really have to think carefully, you know, when you're building a model um, where, you know, in my case, if I'm looking at 
water chemistry or different members of the biota or whatever and how they're related and how they might cause something else really thinking about how these potential confounds are in my data and what the consequences of those are for the kind of analysis I want to do. So let me just talk quickly about each of them. The first one we have, and I've tried to come up with an example and, and forgive me the bias again towards aquatic ecology. Um, you know, Flavia and a couple of others will be happy about this. Others will say, you know, We'll get sick of water and, and aquatic ecology. But anyway, just to kind of try to make it practical, um, if my goal, my research goal, which like at least one of my students has had through the years, um, is what's the relationship between increased benthic algae and zebra mussels, dracaenid mussels in, in freshwater ecosystems? How are they related? And so the first, this first kind of confounding variable called the fork is when, and the confounding variables are indicated with a Z here, is when um, both the predictor, which in my case is um, algae, and the response, which is zebra mussels. I want to know, does, does changing algae really affect zebra mussels? You know, seemed like a reasonable question in the 90s and but if you have something like water temperature that causes an increase in both of them then you got to put z in the model you got to put water temperature in the model because if you don't you'll think that algae are increasing zebra mussels in some functional way or whatever way you you think of unless you consider and correct for that confound. So you got to put Z in the model and, and then you're answering or you're asking the question at a given water temperature, does more algae cause more zebra mussels? So you get at the actual effect of algae rather than the intermediary effect of, of water temperature. So watch out for forks. And if you have forks, put them in the model. The pipe is a different kind of a confound. So this is where a predictor causes some intermediate, which in turn causes the response. So, and, and this happens, by the way, uh, this happened in real life with a lot of the zebra mussel work we did. So increased algae causes increased habitat, which causes increased zebra mussels. So the idea there is you, you don't want to put Z in the model because you're interested in how algae, how the increase in algae might be, or change in algae might be affecting the zebra mussels. Whatever the mechanism might be, might be increased habitat, might be increased uh, alternative food supply or whatever. But if you, if you put Z in the model, then you'd be saying, okay, this increased algae at a given amount of habitat cause an increase in zebra mussels. So you'll kind of lose the, potentially lose the effect of algae if you put it in the model. So you got to be on the watch for, in your research, for pipes as confounds. Um, another kind of, uh, another kind of confounding variable known as a collider, if both your predictor and your response variables cause the intermediate. So if either increased algae or zebra mussels cause increased oxygen depletion, don't put it in the model because, again, you're interested in does increased algae cause increased zebra mussels? You, you don't want to correct for something like oxygen depletion and then lose whatever effect the algae might have on zebra mussels. So that's that's my story. Sorry, I went a bit longer than I wanted to, but um, yeah, definitely we'll, we'll look at how the actual coding works, again, at a very kind of simple level next week. And, uh, but the bottom line with this is in the statistical rethinking approach, two things I think that have been super valuable for me. One is, and again, you don't have to become a frequentist to really look carefully at cause and confounding as I was talking about those last few slides. So you've got that, 
plus you got the Bayes approach, which again, for me, it's not about some sort of statistical philosophical argument. It's just I kind of get more with the Bayes approach. I'm not just deciding between null and something else. I'm actually seeing what of this whole myriad of hypotheses might the evidence might point towards. So there you go.